Hello, good morning. Um, we are uh, in the One UP Applied Mathematics webinar series and we are now live in YouTube. But um, let's wait for some minutes to start and the Rainier will introduce our speaker today. Um, thank you, uh, Jomar. But uh, actually, uh, Dr. Neri, hi, Sir Neri is here. So Dr. Neri is the head of our uh, research group. Um, I think uh, it's okay. It's uh, better if uh, Sir Neri will introduce her, Diana. Okay. okay Hello. Good morning, Sir Neri. Sir Marik. Okay, uh, good morning to everyone. It is a privilege to be part of this One UP Applied Math webinar series. And uh, our speaker for today is, uh, we would like to announce, uh, she is a new member of the faculty of the Institute of Mathematics in UP Diliman. And we are pleased and honored to have her in the team, especially here in the optimization and approximation group of uh, the Institute of Mathematics. So her talk today will be on the gradient flow of weighted interface energy and its application to tissue morphogenesis. So let us welcome Ms. Rudaina Mohammed. Thank you very much, sir, for the introduction. Um, I'm Rudaina. I'm I'm here to talk about gradient flow and of weighted interface energy um, with emphasis on uh, modeling tissue morphogenesis. So this uh, is my work as a postdoctoral fellow at Kyoto University under the supervision of um, Dr. Karel Schwadlenka and our collaborators, um, togashi san and morakawa san So um, the flow of um, this talk today. So we'll just start with uh, our main research interest and then uh, a review of what we've done on uh, volume preserving mean curvature flow. And then the second half would be on the application to tissue morphogenesis and some numerical results. Oops. All right, so um, our focus is on evolving interfaces. So for example, you have here a picture of a uh, water dew so the interface is basically just the boundary between two phases, in this case, the liquid and the gas phase. Okay. Um, so you can also uh, see this behavior in bubbles or soap films um, or dripping faucets. So these kinds of uh, physical phenomena, what happens is um, the molecules at the surface of the water, they are um, in an energetically unpro uh, favorable position compared to the ones that are in the interior. So in this case, because they are not in a favorable position, they will try to move, um, which in turn uh, uh, forms the steady state or the steady configuration of the droplet or the soap field. So in essence, they want to move so that they can de decrease the surface energy. Um, the same thing can be observed in polycrystalline uh, materials. So here there are different grains and each of these grains have different orientations. So at the boundary, because of this mismatch of orientations, they, there, there's an extra free energy that will, they will try to reduce as well. Um, the focus of this talk as well is on uh, tissue morphogenesis or you have here an image of an organ culture of an olfactory epithelium. Um, so you can see that the cells will try to move as well um, in the, the viewpoint of free energy uh, minimization principle as well. So these um, examples, oops, okay. So these examples, uh, there are different objects that try to decrease their surface energy as fast as possible. So trying to find for a steady configuration or some minimal surface when possible. So to investigate such dynamics, we consider a bounded domain. So in this case, um, omega, where we partition into different uh, closed sets, C, where they intersect only at boundaries, which we call interfaces. So we have different phase regions 
and they intersect at the, uh, their common boundary, which we call interfaces. So the energy the in consideration is uh, this total, excuse me, total surface energy, uh, where we consider some weights, which will later on makes uh, some sense when we consider uh, cell dynamics. So um, it has been shown um, by Morgan that the, this is well posed as long as the triangle inequality for this sigma, which you can think of as a surface tension. Um, so as long as this triangle inequality holds. So our goal is to investigate the L2 gradient flow for this energy, um, considering the volume preservation as a constraint. So what does this um, L2 gradient flow look like? Well, at the interface, the normal velocity will be by uh, mean curvature. You can think of curvature basically as how much the interface is curved at the point. Um, on the other hand, at the triple junction, so this is a point where three different interfaces meet, it satisfies this herring angle condition. So if the surface tensions are equal, it means that at the tri, uh, at the tri uh, tricellular junction, um, you will get equal junction angles. So it would be 120, 120, and 120 degrees when at the steady state. So for example, when we have a simple case where you have um, two phases like the water do earlier, so you have the interior phase and the outside phase, the blue one here is the initial curve. So the uh, L2 gradient flow will be as follows. So it will move by curvature in essence, until it becomes um, a circle and disappears, because in this case, there is no uh, volume constraint. So basically, this is mean curvature flow. All right. So there are existing numerical methods. There are explicit methods and implicit methods um, in, in this viewpoint. The explicit one is when you have a curve, you parameter, parameterize it. If you compute for the velocity at each of these points and then move them towards the, the direction and with that velocity. So this is called the front tracking uh, method. Uh, and it's largely used as well. The implicit approach on the other hand represents the curve as some level set. So there's some zero level set of some function. So in this sense, the normal and the, the normal per, uh, yeah, the normal vector rather and the curvature can be represented in terms of u. So if you want to move uh, this by mean curvature, so you can um, take the partial derivative of u with respect to t, apply chain rule, and that would give you this uh, level set equation right here. So all you need to do to move this is basically solve this parabolic equation. Now, um, for the ex explicit approach, one reason, um, why we don't uh, consider it. So some, uh, there, there are advantages as well, but in our case, one reason why we don't consider this is there are cases when you need to redistribute the nodes um, if there are some deformations. So pwede silang maipon at, at a certain region. Um, there, it's also possible for certain topological uh, conditions na, so for example, at this point here, uh, in sa gitna ng parang eight or infinity. So you have a single point at front tracking, but then if you compute, you know, where will this point go? So one, one possible numerical surgery would be to put another point and then split them. That's also another solution. So these are things that we want to avoid. The level set method um, can handle this topological um, changes implicitly. So that's why we want to focus on, on this. Now, notice also if um, your level set function here is the sine distance, so you get, uh, it will satisfy the econol equation, and this will reduce your level set equation to just the heat equation. So for a short time, you get, you can solve the heat equation whose solution appro approximates that of the level set equation, so in essence, intuitively, what uh, Merriman, Benz, and Osher did was to capitalize on this approach. So the idea is we can solve the heat equation for a short time and redo that over and over again. So for example, if you have this curve, a simple circle, so you can uh, set the characteristic function and then solve the heat equation without needing to solve the uh, other level set 
equation earlier, much more difficult level set equation earlier, and then cut it at the zero level set and do it over and over again. So each of those discrete solutions, uh, time discrete solutions, will be an approximation to um, the gradient flow uh, of the surface energy or the main curvature flow. So like this example. So this is the approximation and this is the algorithm. So you're doing the characteristic function and solving the heat equation um, over and over again. So this is a classical method and there are several convergence proofs of different approaches that had been established already. Um, one problem though for the MBO algorithm is that you no, know, it can get stuck because if you're using the characteristic function. So an alternative is to use the sign distance so that you have subgrid accuracy. So um, the previous uh, one that I've shown you is just for a two-phase. So if for a multi-phase, you can also do that. But the idea here is that you have to look at each of the phases um, independently and try to solve the heat equation there or solve this convolution, compute the, the convolution on the other end. Um, and then you will have different uh, PIs for each of those um, uh, cells or phases, and then you take the maximum to determine where uh, the new evolution is. So again, um, the drawback is still where it gets stuck. So you need to choose the right time read uh, restrictions. But because here we're using the convolution, it can be quite implemented uh, quite efficiently. You can just use the FFT. All right, now, what we're interested in is, is not only mean curvature flow, but a volume preserving mean curvature flow. So the question is, how do we incorporate volume uh, constraints or how do we preserve the volume? So like in this case, the steady state in this whole film is you know, having the volumes preserved. So uh, what we did was to do a vector approach to the MBO. Um, so we defined some reference vectors but so that we do, it doesn't get stuck, we use this reference vector to do a vector analog of the sine distance. So with this, we get some subgrid accuracy. And then for the convolution, so because now it's a vector uh, in a vector form, you just need to solve the vector valued heat equation. And then for the thresholding, instead of cutting it at the level set, we're just projecting it now to the reference vector to determine at which, um, phase the points are on the next evolution. So with this uh, vector approach, uh, we've shown that the algorithm um, uh, is equal, uh, has a velocity equal to minus curvature at every point on the interface. And then it's also stable at the junction. So it approaches the 120, 120, 120 degrees at a steady state. So for example, so if you have a four phase here, you will see that implicitly the, the herring angle condition or the junction angle condition is satisfied here. Um, so again, you notice that there is no volume uh, preservation here. So for the volume uh, constraint, there are uh, proposals by Ruth and Wetton. What they did was instead of cutting it at the half level set or the zero level set, whichever one uh, you're taking, um, you change the threshold value. So by this value here, which involves the average curvature. The problem with this is um, when you have a multi-phase case, you're, you may have different interfaces and they will have different mean curvatures. So in essence, you're cutting at different levels and cutting at different levels would probably uh, result in some overlap on the resulting evolutions, or you might have some vacuum. So our approach instead was to modify the diffusion step and not the thresholding step. So we can employ uh, a minimization instead. So we discretize in, term, uh, in time the heat equation. So a natural approach would just be to solve this uh, constrained minimization problem. Uh, of course, you can uh, rewrite this so, so you, you get some, uh, it's easier to solve unconstrained minimizations. So you can solve for the free boundary condition. And this will tell you that as long as you find some suitable lambda and solve this now parabolic equation, you should get an, an approximation to the volume preserving mean curvature flow. 
the problem is again is you you have the average curvature there. So instead of doing that, we employ uh, a penalty method. So we studied this first for a one phase. So we employed this penalty method right here. Um, we did we had some existence and regularity results, which led us to this main result on the penalty method. Um, the point is, as long as you can find some lambda large enough, you don't necessarily have to take lambda to its limit um, to get the solution to the original problem. With enough large lambda, you can get the solution to the problem, which, which is uh, nice in some sense because you get a better approximation to your numerical solution. So we employed this idea for a multi-phase case. So we now have here the diffusion term. So we now add the penalty here. So here you have a 10 phase uh, volume preserving mean curvature flow with the penalization technique to preserve the volume. So we see that you know, implicitly it can handle the topological change there without us having to figure out where the points should go as compared to the front tracking. Um, we also checked um, that for the multi-phase case, um, this penalty uh, is consistent with our one phase analysis. So if you consider like um, a disjoint phase, for example, P P1, a bigger circle and a smaller circle. So the larger circle will grow and the smaller circle will shrink if the volume is preserved. So we can get um, a solution using RK force, which is the, I'm not sure if it's visible, the black one here. So if you increase lambda large enough, you will get uh, an overlap of the solution. All right, now um, for what we focus on uh, today is on tissue morphogenesis. So you've seen um, this picture earlier and we had uh, a model um, to represent the, the configuration. So the cells, the faces here are the cells and the interfaces are the cell-cell junctions. So the motivation for uh, modeling tissue morphogenesis is on um, sensory uh, epithelia. So vertebrates um, possess highly developed sense organs, which detect information about different environments and they uh, convert um, st certain stimuli into electrical signals. And these signals are mediated in the sensory epithelia. So for example, in the ear, um, I have here a picture of the human ear, but actually um, the cell picture here is of a mouse. I'm sorry about that. So you have here um, the picture of the uh, auditory epithelia of a mouse, uh, inner ear of the mouse. So the auditory epithelium has different cell types. So one is the sensory cell, which is the auditory hair cell, which are the green ones here. And then the supporting cells, there are several kinds of supporting cells here, which are the ones in black. Okay. So these ones here are also supporting cells. So if you notice, so they are of the same kind of phase. So because they have the same phase, they will try to form 120, 120 as, as their steady state. Okay. But in here, because they are intermingled with the hair cells, so what we see is that the pattern is more of a checkerboard-like pattern. So what the developmental biologists thought is that these particular patterns are conserved um, evolutionarily among wide range of species, not only on, on mice, um, and it is thought to be important for sensory functions. Um, later studies revealed that it's actually a possible mechanism to understand this patterning or cellular rearrangement. In fact, um, one of our collaborators, um, Professor Togashi, um, they observed that cellular rearrangement of auditory uh, epithelia from the embryonic day 14 to 18, they observed that at 16, they form a checkerboard pattern. And until 18, they, this then forms into kind of a football pattern. Um, later, Katsunuma, which is also in the same project as Togashi-san, um, what they observe in the olfactory uh, epithelia is that, so here, um, the olfactory cells are the yellow ones here, or the smaller ones, if you can see from uh, on the ZO1 immunostadium. Okay. 
So the bigger ones are the supporting cells. So they observe that at E14, so at the fourth day of its embryonic stage, the supporting, uh, the olfactory cells cluster together. So they kind of segregate. And then at E16, so at the 16th day, um, these uh, olfactory cells move out. So they uncluster until the postnatal stage where they form kind of a football pattern. But of course, in the postnatal stage, you'll see that the number of cells increase. So the question here is what drives the cellular rearrangement? And what we want to achieve is that through the model, we want to verify that uh, their hypothesis on what drives cellular rearrangement uh, is consistent with uh, what they have observed experimentally. Okay, so some of the studies um, to answer what drives cellular rearrangement is from observations from Togashi-san. So you've seen this picture earlier, they form a checkerboard pattern. What they've seen is that hair cells express nectin-1, which is a cell addition molecule, and the, uh, the supporting cells express nectin-3, which is a different kind of cell addition molecule. So they form a checkerboard pattern in this case. On the right is a, an experiment on cultured cells where the, the nectin-1 is on the green on the right side and nectin-3 are cells that express, uh, yeah, the cells on red rather are the ones that express nectin-3. And what we see, oops, okay, what we see um, is that these different types of nectin allow them to intermingle at the boundary, which explains um, a checkerboard-like pattern. Um, this is consistent because um, they have observed that nectins are more heterotypic than homotypic, which means they would adhere more to a different type of nectin than their own. So these nectins, um, when cells come into contact, so it's the nectins that are the first one that forms, and then they will recruit cadherin, which is another cell addition molecule. So uh, um, this recruitment happens um, along and uh, until they along the, the addition belt until they establish the adherence junction. So this cadherin is kind of the opposite of the nectin. It's more homotypic than um, heterotypic. So, oops. So what it means is that the cadherins will adhere more to the same type. So in this case, E cadherins would adhere more to each other than uh, a different type. So for example, here you have the cultural cell. The red one is expresses N cadherin and the green one expresses E cadherin. So you will see that they um, cluster together, the same types cluster together. So you have a segregated pattern which is similar to what we've observed in E14 in the olfactory uh, stage. All right, so as we've said, um, this occurs along the adhesion belt, right? So they, this is where um, epithelial cell cell adhesions are mediated and where nectins and cadherins cooperate. And then once they uh, form along the adhesion adherence junction, they will bind intracellular proteins like P120 catenin and beta catenin. So from this viewpoint, it is enough to consider a 2D model of uh, the cell aggregate or the tissue because it only happens along the addition belt. So we can reduce this to a 2D uh, aggregates of cells uh, similar to the representation earlier. So the faces are now the cells and the interfaces are the cell-cell um, junction. The cellular rearrangement are what we, we now consider as the L2 gradient flow of the weighted surface energy, constrained by the cell's um, preserved volume. So in this case, we consider the region um, where, according to the developmental biologists that, that we are collaborating with, the, they have observed that the cells do not diminish uh, in size. If it does, it's, kind, it's negligible in this case. Um, we also do not consider cell death. So the number of cells in the evolutions are maintained and we don't also consider um, cell division. So the weights now um, can be in terms of cell-cell uh, adhesion. 
strength. All right, now, of course, modeling this, this kind of phenomena is not new. So there are existing models like the vertex dynamics model. Uh, what the vertex dynamic model does is that it represents cells as uh, polygons. So basically you're just computing for the motion of the cells on the uh, vertices of these polygons. So this is also based on the free energy minimization principle. So it takes the gradient descent of this potential free energy. So you have, uh, again, the total free energy as earlier, plus the penalty for the volume. All right, this is uh, faster because you only need to consider certain points. The only problem is um, you cannot consider like um, curve junctions, cell, curve cell-cell junctions. Um, also, it's difficult to determine if the herring angle conditions are satisfied if you have different types of cells. Another one which is probably more important to address is that um, the vertex dynamics model is kind of similar to the front tracking model. So what happens is um, if there is cellular intercalation as what you see uh, down here, so this is a photo taken from Katsunuma's paper. So the S will intercalate between o, the olfactory cells. So to model this under the vertex dynamics model, you have to set some threshold distance. And then you have to, to kind of make an ad hoc algorithm that if it uh, passes this threshold, that's the time you kind of flip. So it's kind of um, a numerical surgery in this sense. So what we want to achieve is to avoid this and hopefully using level sets, we don't need to worry about these topological changes. Another one which is commonly used is the cellular paths model. So what this does is kind of give you a pixelated approximation of the cell configuration of, or of the tissue. So of course, if you use more pixels, then you have a better approximation of, of the cell configuration that you're dealing with. But then again, you have more computation computations to do. So again, here, you're just kind of changing the assignment of where the grid points are, where the grid point, to what cells the grid points belong, as long as the energy um, decreases in this case. You can represent like one grid point to one cell, like this uh, simulation here found on Katsunuma's paper, or you can also do a mass of grid points to represent one cell. So it depends on uh, the, the purpose of using the model. Um, as what we've made a comment on the vertex dynamics, so you cannot also consider curve here unless you have more pixels. Um, another one is it's also difficult to determine if the herring angle conditions are satisfied. For both of these uh, models as well, we have to introduce certain additional parameters. For example, in the vertex dynamics, we have to introduce this parameter here to address uh, cellular intercalations. All right, so our aim is to develop an algorithm that can reproduce this um, cellular rearrangements to give us the observed embryonic uh, cellular patterns, one wherein we can address curved uh, shapes or non -zero curve, uh, interfaces with non-zero curvature. So that we can do with level sets. One implicitly um, satisfies the herring angle condition, have minimum number of parameters as much as possible. In this sense, if you can minimize the parameters, we can determine if what uh, the parameter that we are using is actually a factor in the dynamics. And the fourth one is that implicitly it can handle um, cellular intercalations and other topological uh, changes without doing ad hoc uh, algorithms like the uh, vertex dynamics earlier. Now, uh, what we did, our first approach was to modify our vector approach. So in, um, instead, we will specify what the junction angle should be. And in essence, this will tell us that there is a need to change the reference vectors. Um, the problem with this method, it's, it's only, um, what they call this, uh, restricted to a three-phase case. So it's difficult to kind of uh, extend this to a multi-phase case. So what we did instead was to adopt an energy approximation technique by Esedublo and Otto. 
So what they did was to approximate the surface area uh, using the heat content approximation by Alberti and Bellettini. So the idea here is that you can approximate the length of the interface by how much heat ex uh, escapes from CG, uh, from cell J to cell I, if you're measuring the length at IJ. So using this approximation, uh, we can rewrite the uh, uh, energy. So we can approximate the energy rather in this manner. And um, this is okay because it, ha uh, it has been shown by Lau and Otto that this converges, uh, uh, yeah, this energy gamma converges to the, uh, yeah, to the weighted energy. Now, the question now is to how to incorporate the cell volumes. Well, that's easy. We just need to add this additional constraint. Um, the only thing is it's non-convex. So we need to kind of relax so that we get some convex set. Um, this is okay to do because similarly, so this we can compare this to, to this proposition by S. Dublin and Otto. We can similarly show that So we can similarly show that the minimizer over uh, script B here would be the same as that in the relapsed constraint set. Um, the second thing is um, our energy that we consider here is nonlinear. So the next thing that we need to do is to linearize that. So in essence, we now have this um, subsequent uh, minimization scheme. So our energy is now linearized. We now have a convex constraint set. So we have shown, therefore, that the minimizers at the relaxed cons uh, convex constraint set is the same as that of the, of the original constraint. Hence, at the next evolution, we get the, uh, the same minimizer as that found in, in script B. So from this scheme, uh, this leads us to this optimization strategy. So now we can consider a level set vector field that describes the cell configuration. And then we do the subsequent minimization um, to get the next uh, evolution. So note that without the, so this minimization is over the, the constraint set. So without the volume requirement on, on script K, this is just the original SWO auto. Uh, algorithm. All right, so how do we numerically treat the volume constraint then? So uh, a natural approach is just to use some Lagrange multiplier. And you can show that this one is uh, unconditionally gradient stable, so it dissipates the, the energy. Um, but the, the problem is you have to compute for this uh, Lagrange multiplier every time. So another approach, which is a better approach, takes on or treats the problem as an assignment problem. So as an assignment problem is, is typically posed as a maximization. So we take one minus P, so which is now psi. So we maximize that. And then um, with having the volume constraint right here. So since assignment problems are discrete, so we take a discrete analog of this problem. So we, discrete, we take discrete points. Uh, that approximates our domain. And then for the volume, so our discrete volume is uh, set in such a way that this uh, ratio uh, is satisfied. So now the idea is that you can think of the cells as some clubs, which allows only limited members like the number VI, and then you can think of X as the people that wants to be members of those spaces or those cells. So this psi here would be how much um, those people want to be a member of the club, which are the cells. So how much the point want to be in the cell basically. So the problem is just to match the people to the faces so that everyone is happy. All right. So of course, the ideal solution is that every point would be in their preferable phase. But of course, the problem with that is you know, if, if one club is popular, then more will go there. 
So to solve that problem, we have to set some membership kind of fee for the cell. Um, and each of the point must bid to be in the cell. So if there are all fewer numbers, uh, fewer points within the cell, then the cell just accepts it. However, if there are more, then it will just keep the ones with larger bids and then update the price of the cell um, based on the smallest bid. So basically, kung more than the required number of points, the one with the smallest bid will be kicked out. So this auction will be done over and over until all the phases are uh, has the right number of uh, volume, the script volume. Okay. So this is the auction dynamics in a sense. So we, we use um, a volume constraint version for the SWO auto and then numerically treat the volume using auction dynamics. Um, one problem is um, if we have, for example, this case where you have um, the sigma value or the surface tension between B, B is one and R, R. So we only have one R here, so it doesn't matter. But between B, R is 0 0.30. So this satisfies the triangle inequality. But for this case, the and there is volume constraint using auction dynamics, the cell kind of splits. So the red one transfers a part of it here because we are conserving the volume. And this does not make sense in the cells. So the cells does not split and then magically appear elsewhere. So there is now a topological constraint in our problem. Um, to solve this, a resolution would be to localize auction dynamics. So kind of the points around here cannot be to this red one because it's far away, which makes sense because cells can only sense those uh, cells around it and adjust with regards to the neighboring cells. So we include this topological constraint by employing a localized auction dynamics. And with this, um, we are able to yeah, keep uh, cell connectivity in this regard. All right. So this is uh, a summary of the algorithm. So you have the convolution, and this is the volume constraint together with the threshold. And we localize. Um, the auction dynamics by only letting it uh, find its preferred uh, faces within a neighbor of the point. So to test if this is okay, we have here versus the vertex dynamics model on the left. So this is the case where you have um, a wild type um, olfactory. So this is the case where it splits. So these points is uh, our addition strengths were these olfactory cells, I'm not sure if you can see the small ones, um, they, they split. So they have the same initial condition. So if you notice, um, the level set uh, based model or our proposed algorithm right away um, lets the blue one intercalate, but it takes a while for the vertex dynamics to do that because as we said earlier, it has to satisfy a certain threshold for it to to split, so it takes a kind of a while. So it's, it, you can compute this fast, but you know, it takes a while for it to, to intercalate. Okay. Another thing is that um, here you will see the curved uh, junctions, cell-cell junctions on this uh, level set, and that is not catered here because uh, no, it's represented as polygons only. All right. Um, so the second one is um, on cellular patterning. So Katsunuma, they hypothesized that the different uh, cellular patterns that they've observed in, in, in sensory epithelia may be uh, caused by the relative intensity of beta catenin. Uh, so remember the beta catenins are the ones from the, are, that are intercellular proteins that are recruited after um, the adherence junctions are, are uh, established, right? So if um, you have here N2, meaning nectin2, um, and it also expresses NCAD, meaning uh, NCAD herring. So if between the, the blue-blue cells, it's less than the one between blue-red and much less than the one between red-red, you will get uh, a segregated pattern. So this happens when you have this uh, 
uh, mixed culture of uh, certain transpectans. For this particular, so they both have uh, NCAD, but the blue one is Nectin 2 and the red one is Nectin 3. So you will have a checkerboard pattern. So this, and then for the football, um, they both have NCAD herring, but the red one has e, uh, expresses ECAD herring and the blue one expresses Nectin 2. So this forms kind of a football pattern. So we tried to um, verify um, if this indeed produced the certain pattern. So we use the same initial condition for all of this in, in use hypothetical values satisfying um, this relationship above um, to see if they will form the hypothesized uh, patterns. So on the left, you see that the red and blue uh, segregate, so the blue clusters and the red cluster. On the middle, so it satisfies this value, you see that it forms a checkerboard pattern and on the right, it forms the football pattern. So this confirms the um, hypothesis on the various transpectans that leads to different mosaic patterns uh, in Katsuyuma. So the third one, uh, if you recall, we've shown this earlier. This was what they've observed on the olfactory epithelium. So uh, you have here the different patterns. Um, they actually measured the beta catenin uh, accumulations for this um, particular study. So we use the beta catenin um, accumulations or beta catenin intensity accumulations um, as um, a parameter for the cell cell adhesion. So using that value, we started with um, some initial condition. This is not the initial condition. Yet. And then, so you can see here on the right how the beta catenin uh, intensity changes. So you see that at E14, they cluster, which is the same as what we've seen uh, earlier. And then it moves to E16, so where they kind of split, move out from the cluster, so they split. Um, they actually measured E14, E16, and then E18. So this is now going to E18. So you can, there's only a slight difference in the beta catenin uh, intensity. And then the last one that they've measured is on the uh, postnatal first day uh, stage. So for the postnatal, uh, day one, okay, somehow I cannot. All right, so it's going to postnatal day one. So what you see is instead of forming a football pattern, they're trying to kind of cluster or, yeah, they're trying to kind of cluster, which is different. So in the embryonic stage, we more or less get um, a similar behavior, but the postnatal, we don't get this pattern here. So that hints uh, in telling us that maybe in the postnatal stage, beta catenin uh, is not the only factor that contributes to um, cellular rearrangement. We can, however, kind of say that in the embryonic stage, beta catenin is enough to tell us how much, uh, how the cells rearrange in uh, 14 to 18. All right. Um, the last one is on developing uh, auditory epithelia. So we know earlier, oops. Oh, wait. So if you remember earlier from E16, it was a checkerboard and then E18, it forms into a uh, football. So we don't have the experimental values of beta catenin in this case, but we use hypothetical values to try to generate the cellular rearrangements. So this is at E14. And at E16, it should form a checkerboard pattern, which we have here. And then from the checkerboard, so it should give us kind of a football pattern. All right, okay. So we were able to get using these hypothetical val values, um, hopefully 
uh, when we get the experimental measurements for the beta catenin, we can verify if more or less this will be the same as our hypothetical values uh, since we get the cellular patterns. So, yeah, so that's the last part of uh, my talk. I'm sorry if I was talking too fast. So if you have any questions, please do ask. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Muhammad. Are there any questions coming from the participants? If you have a question, then since we are only several people here, you can directly unmute your mic and uh, give your question. Any question or reaction from the group? Hi, sir. Hello. Question for Afua. Hi, hi, uh, sir. Nery. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Si hi, uh, Ben, my question. Si, si Ranger ben. muna. Okay, go Ranger. Ah, uh, pero mm -hmm. but before that, um, okay. Hey, sir. Hello. Okay, oh, sir. Okay. Uh, so yun. Um, so Rodayna, thank you. A very yes. interesting talk. <laughs> um, so tingin mo ay dun sa di ba sa mo ay nag may kakalabote na, na biologists. Tama ba? Mm -hmm. ano, ano tingin mo yung um, ano yung sort of naging contribution nila? Nag, nag ano ba kayo? Pinakita niyo ba yung mga simulations? And, uh, pina yeah. Uh, Verify ba nila na ito talaga yung naging itsura? Um, actually, cons yeah, may constant kind of meeting kami with them. So usually in the initial stages, um, may mga comments siya na um, this one looks unnatural. Like for us, it makes sense. Kind of if you compute uh, numerically, it makes sense. Pero may mga ma-observe yung biologists na ano, ay hindi to nangyayari sa cells. Parang ang weird nitong motion na to. So, and then from there, we try to readjust. So parang from the from the model formulation pa from the beginning. Yeah, from the beginning. Hanggang, hanggang result meron na silang uh, sort of uh, contribution. Yes, yes. Okay. Tapos ay um yung mga patterns pa na ito ay uh -huh. na observe na ba nila sa 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 lab or something. Hmm. Yung pinakita kong ano, yung sa motivation galing sa kanila yung results na yun, like this one. So, ito yung mismong um, observations nila sa tissue. Tapos, gumawa sila ng schema. Um, parang, kind of their hypothesis na ito yung um, patterns. Pero, ang style kasi nila to determine what um, kind of is responsible for cellular intercalation ng ginagawa nila as much as I'm not a biologist as much as I understood is what they do is knock out um, certain like uh, either addition molecule or magna knock out sila ng protein and then they will try to see pag ma knock out ba to magche-change ba yung pattern kung magche-change yung pattern then they kind of can tell na ah ito yung probably responsible uh, bakit Nag, nagiging ganito yung pattern. So medyo magkaiba yung approach nila to see how the patterns form or what's responsible for the pattern um, sa ginagawa natin sa modeling. So I think ang na-appreciate nila is like they can see from our model paano actually nag intercalate Kasi pag sa, pag sa lab, nakikita lang, pinipicture lang nila like after 30 minutes, then they can see. So May mga videos din sila actually ng mga motion ng cells. Okay. So may nagkaroon ba kayo ng sort of um, parameter tuning para para makuha yung ina-expect nila o um, so nag-set lang kayo ng mga values na ina-expect yung, oh, yung para sa auditory, kami lang yung nag-set. Pero yung sa olfactory kasi, na-measure na nila yung sa beta catenin. So, yung una naming ginawa is to use yung exactly na beta catenin intensity na na-measure nila. And, yeah, more or less, nakukuha naman yung pattern. Okay. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I, I apologize. Uh, si Jomar palang host, no? Uh, 
nasanay kasi ako na kapag may webinar sa amin, kapag when I introduce the person, ako directly yung nag-officiate ng questions. Pero I apologize for that. So I give the floor to Dr. Rabahante. <laughs> no, sir. Okay po yun. Sir, Neri, go lang. <laughs> yes po. May question din po ako kay Rodaina kasi. Okay po. Go lang. Go lang sige, you ngayon. take the floor. So you take the floor, Jomar. Okay. okay. Uh, Rodaina, question lang. Um, sige po. Are there already uh, with similar ano uh, uh, approach or uh, study uh, for cancer morphogenesis, the tumor or tumor uh, formation, and how dif- different yung magiging dynamics compared to the natural uh, uh, cells? Um, hindi ko pa natingnan exactly kung meron similar, but it's like um, at least a goal because I think. Um, with regards to tumor, mas mahirap siya in the sense na iba yung growth, may cell growth na, di ba? So, iba yung rate ng growth ng, ng cancer cells compared dun sa iba na, na hindi. So, it would be interesting to see, I think, um, if pwede i-apply itong model and add probably something uh, for, for the probably rate, growth rate ng cancer cells. Pero with regards to um, ano yung reason uh, for the cancer cells to grow, aside from me thinking na random in terms of numerics, um, that I cannot answer. But it would be interesting, I think. Okay. And also in terms of comparing different... Uh, but, but this is more on the evolutionary side. Also comparing yes, yes. cells na nag-evolve. That this this yes. approach can also be used, no, to 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 differentiate different cells, or to differentiate wala pa. different. Cells. I mean, I mean, uh, if if let's say there is one tissue, na uh, mm-hmm. um, we think evolved through time, and mm-hmm. comparing it with another tissue, na sort of like an ancestor of that uh, uh, tissue or organ, or an di pala pang ganong uh, mm-hmm. uh, parang to detect na mm, I don't think so kasi this one is more of like reproducing the dynamics kind of mm-hmm. okay so it's it, it's more on the reproducing the dynamics na uh, with yeah. possible possibly so, we can see from the experimental side okay mm-hmm. okay thank you go no, Sarneri okay po okay sige may question ako Rodaina Uh, in your proposed scheme, you have a nonlinear model. Yes. But then to apply, I think, the assignment approach, you had to mm-hmm. linearize the model. Okay. So, so my question is, yung solution ba na kuha nyo doon sa linearized model, ano ba siya? Um, meron bang convergence ito? I mean, is there a sort of convergence towards a solution of the original nonlinear model of the original actually nasa i think nasa paper ni Lau and Otto so yun mm-hmm. yung more na theoretical um, treatment ng ng energy approximation na to sir so me, meron nang gumawa actually kasi um, what we did was to incorporate the volume constraint and if we look at the computation more or less pareho lang naman siya to some extent so may study na na yes, the okay. the sequence of solutions and linearized model uh, after some tuning some parameters yes. will converge to the solution to of the, the curvature yes of the mean um, okay thank you yeah in some weak sense i think mm-hmm. So those from the other participants in the group, do they have any question? Sige, may question um, pa rin ako. Sir, ah, sige, may sige. question po from YouTube. We are also live in YouTube pala. Okay. Ay, sige. Paki, uh, uh, sige. Pakibasa mo, Jomar. Okay Jomar. lang po, basahin ko. So okay, from Romel Real. Okay po. From Romel Real. Hi, what's the importance of Uh, it, it's very gener- generic, no? What's the importance of mathematical modeling for tissue morphogenesis? Siguro you can important? explain, Rodaina. Uh, Come again, sir, sorry. What's the importance of... 
Okay. Hello. Sorry. Uh, what's the importance of mathematical modeling for tissue morphogenesis? May naglalag ba ako? Sorry. Baka ako lang ata. Sorry. Um, actually, hindi lang naman yung model namin yung nag first na nag uh, treat ng tissue morphogenesis. Like I said earlier, there have been other uh, methods like the vertex dynamics model, cellular POTS model, and so much more. Um, one advantage is like we can see how the cells move. Hindi lang siya like um, pag kasi sa biological side, what they can see are kind of time lapses or, or pictures at different points. But like how it moves from this this stage, let's say from E14 to E16, um, they will kind of they will guess what happens um, using biological uh, methods. Pero with the model, kind of pwede mong makita yung exact dynamics, how the cells rearrange to the next pattern and from that to the next pattern. At, at least with regards to to our mathematical model. Of course, sa iba, there are other purposes as well. I hope I answered the question. Okay, sige, Sir Neri. Okay, so uh, any other from the from the uh, participants? Any question? Uh, if I can add yung kanina, it's kind of one way to confirm kung kung um, consistent ba yung biological uh, results sa numerical results. So, pwede rin siyang baliktad, pwede mo rin gamitin yung numerical results to kind of hypothesize anong mangyayari sa biology side or pwede rin vice versa para lang i-confirm yung, yung data. Kasi magkaibang proseso yung ginagamit to determine how the cell evolves, uh, yeah, how the tissue develops rather. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, medyo na, na curious ako dito sa bidding process no? alam ko kasi sa bidding <laughs> sa, sa gobyerno lang yan tas maraming corruption na nangyayari dyan <laughs> so wala namang corruption sa bidding na ito no? uh, I mean uh, <laughs> nakaka-interest lang yung, yung, yung when you say na yung magbibid siya ano yun? controlled yes, ba yung bidding? Nayon, or is it a result of the numerics? Or do you numerics have a control? Plan. Numerics plan talaga siya. Ha. Ha. So walang control yung naginagawa yung, ano, yung user. Wala yung po. Bale, yung bid niya po is, um, if I can scroll to that, yung bid niya po depende sa, uh, nandito pa. So depende sa, so for example, yung isang point, um, pipili siya ng dalawang preferred cell. So saan mm -hmm. siya mas malapit based sa solution. Tapos, depende dun sa price dun sa cell na yon at saka yung sa preference niya, makokompit natin yung bid niya. So, with this, ma-determine saan siya mas, mas dapat in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So yung value ng price na yon is changing in time then? Opo, opo. So the more na sikat yung isang cell, mas tumataas din yung yung membership price niya. Mm -hmm. So yung, yung mga, mga hindi nakakabid natatanggal. Parang habig siya sa mga pheromones no sa ant colony optimization, no? <laughs> yung mas dinadaanan, mas nagiging preferable. Opo. opo. Okay, sige. That's interesting. Okay, so uh Jomar, I have no more question. Uh, I, I turn over again the hosting duties to you. Or si Renier ba yung nagsimula? Okay, thank you. Oh, sige, Jomar. Okay po. Thank you, Sir Neri. Thank you po for those people who attended this uh, Zoom meeting and also for those people in YouTube. And uh, I hope that... Uh, in the next uh, 
applied mathematics, one UP applied mathematics webinar series you're going to attend uh, again. So um, we're not going to, to make this uh, webinar too long. Okay, so uh, I hope you had a very uh, nice morning with Rodaina. Thank you very much, Rodaina. Are you still in Japan or Thank nasa you. Philippines? Thank you. Nasa Philippines. Nasa Philippines. Okay, sige. And also, congratulations uh, for uh, a new new faculty member no, ng UP Diliman. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Pop, uh, Sir Neri, um, Sir Gino, Nandi Sir Gino, si Ma'am uh, Tina, Rainier, and uh, sa mga nasa YouTube po. Thank you very much and see you again in our next uh, webinar series. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Happy you, lunch. Thank you. Happy lunch. Bye-bye.